We're getting this out of the way right off the bat so I don't forget to do this again. The description from the overture for Rule 2, imagine who you could be and then aim single-mindedly at that, tells us that we're going to use stories and an old alchemical image to talk about what an integrated human personality is and how to achieve one. So, coming at this from a cognitive psychology perspective, or really any other form of psychology that isn't depth, is going to be a bit of a misfit. Cool. This video made possible thanks to continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to This Cognitive Psychologist's ongoing ponderings about how this book is helping anyone. And the style madness flows pretty freely in this chapter, so you know we're in for some good times ahead. No sense in dilly-dallying. Quick refresher for the visual shorthand I use to indicate where ideas are coming from in these videos. This means I'm paraphrasing the book. This indicates I'm responding to the book or integrating my thoughts with science, where I can. The majority of Peterson's references aren't. And now would probably be a good time to mention that this rule has a grand total of 10 endnotes. Of those 10, two are to scholarly works, two are to religious works of some form, there's a Jung and Tolkien, and four are to maps of meaning or 12 rules. The Peterson ones are particularly maddening, as they're burying the proper research behind a layer of lobstery obfuscation. Anyways, let's start down this path of aiming single-mindedly at who we could be. you are. After all, you are complex beyond your own understanding. More complex than anything else that exists, excepting other people. Complex beyond belief. Yeah, I'm already jumping in. It's gonna be that kind of chapter. Humans as the pinnacle of creation, once again. And don't get me wrong, we are complex things, but so are lots of other things, organic or not. And it might just be me, but I can believe our complexity, like, exhibit A. One person's awe at the possibility of evolution is another person's unbelievable complexity, I guess. These are ideas we saw in the first 12 rules. You can't begin to fathom how complex you are, or you can't really know yourself or your beliefs. Coincidentally, that's where the no such thing as an atheist came in, and you may recall I wasn't on board with any of this. In the context of that rule, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. This auto-bio-unknowable idea was to tell the reader that because of this purported knowledge gap, you have to turn to an authoritative source for how to live your life, specifically the Christian Bible. Would you be surprised if I were to tell you that the Bible factors in significantly to this chapter as well? Your ignorance is further complicated by the intermingling of who you are with who you could be. You are not only something that is, you are something that is becoming, and the potential extent of that becoming also transcends your understanding. You heard it here. You are ignorant about who you really are and who you could be. It's like the self-help version of negging. The wise Dr. P told me, I can't understand myself or begin to understand me. Guess I was wrong about my sense of self and my five-year plan. But for an agreement on the gist, sure. You are not fixed in who you are. You are capable of change and growth, and you may not realize some of the things you can do if you don't try. Could we lose the arcane language, though? Especially as it makes it sound like there is a maximal potential for you that's hidden behind a transcendent paywall. And a recurring question you're going to hear from me in this chapter. Why? Why can't we understand ourselves? Why is this understanding beyond us? Why is our potential messing with our ability to understand ourselves? Everyone has the sense, I believe, that there is more to them than they have yet allowed to be realized. That potential is often obscured by poor health, misfortune, and the general tragedies and mishaps of life. But it can also be hidden by an unwillingness to take full advantage of the opportunities that life offers, abetted by regrettable errors of all sorts, including failures of discipline, faith, imagination, and commitment. Who are you? And, more importantly, 
Who could you be if you were everything that you could conceivably be? Broad level, sure. Everybody probably has at least one untapped skill or talent. And Peterson sort of acknowledges that this can be out of the person's hands because of the various tragedies and mishaps of life. But this nuance is going to go out the window real quick. The focus, moving forward, is going to be on the regrettable errors. Which on the one hand, sure, self-made problems are easier to tackle than systemic ones or things outside the person's control. On the other, I would think it would be important to specify at some point that the advice moving forward is going to be for things that the person has meaningful control over. Otherwise, it kind of reads like this advice should be used everywhere, meaningful control in your life or not, and that's ultimately not helpful. How does one discipline themselves out of, say, a chronic health condition? And yeah, I know there's things a person can do to help improve their quality of life or minimize the impact of their condition on them, but I kind of doubt we're going to find those things in the Bible or Harry Potter. Peterson rhetorically asks if there's places where the answers to these questions can be found. Various creative types have turned observations of the human condition, in actuality and possibility, into creative works. And calling back to the previous rule, he argues that these creative works, specifically the stories, that are the most deep and profound, are the basis for culture. These are the stories upon which the ritual, religious, and philosophical edifices characterizing sophisticated, populous, successful societies are built. Ah, uh, that's why the stories came up in the last rule. Because according to this, you can't have a successful society without the foundational stories. I'm sure you anthropology or sociology types will probably have a more informed opinion here, but it occurred to me. For the surviving old stories, Something that's hard to separate out is the content of the stories that have been preserved and the type of stories preserved. Like, the Bible is arguably a whole bunch of stories all bundled together, but it's also the sacred text of Christianity. There are entire institutions devoted to keeping the document alive. A counterargument to this would be that the religious stories are the most profound and deep. But again, how do you separate out the importance of practicing spirituality and or religion for most of human history from the content matter of the stories themselves. His later analysis of the symbology of Quidditch could suggest that story genres beyond religious works are going to see longer lifespans as society becomes more secular. But I'm getting slightly ahead of myself. He does have a why here. The stories we can neither ignore nor forget are unforgettable for this reason, among others. They speak to something we know, but do not know that we know. Ugh, time out. This reason, among others, is such a cop-out. He always has to be rubbing himself down with butter to be as slippery as possible. We're going into the unconscious again. And not the fun implicit knowledge sort of unconscious, but the depth psychology unconscious. Although we're getting there through a surprising direction. The ancient Greek philosopher Socrates believed that all learning was a form of remembering. Socrates posited that the soul, immortal in its essence, knew everything before it was born anew as an infant. However, at the point of birth, all previous knowledge was forgotten and had to be recalled through the experiences of life. A reference of some form would be helpful here because I'm pretty sure he's talking about anamnesis and credit for that tends to go to Plato, not Socrates. And yeah, I know attribution gets a bit murky here because of Plato's use of Socrates in writing, but a reference could clear that right up or even be incredibly useful to little lobsters who are interested in digging into the philosophy here. As for anamnesis itself, Pearson's description is good. To add a little or explain it slightly differently, the idea is that you don't actually learn things. You just gain access to the memory you had of it from before you were born. Does it need to be said that knowledge doesn't work this way? Because knowledge doesn't work this way. And yes, dear viewer, it does apparently need to be said because Peterson seems to have a different opinion. There is much to be said about this hypothesis, strange as it might appear. There is much that we could do, much that our bodies and minds are capable of doing, that remains dormant right down to the genetic level. Exposure to new experiences activates this dormant potential, releasing abilities built into us over the vast span of our evolutionary history. 
This is, perhaps, the most basic manner in which our bodies retain past wisdom and draw upon it when necessary. It is in this way, although not only this way, that human possibility exists. Thus, there is something profound to be said for the concept of learning as remembering. Reference 1 is a review paper on neuroepigenetics, along with some commentary. Epigenetics is the name for the mechanism that allows for experience to modulate gene expression. Examples of experiences in the paper are things like environmental toxins, maternal behavior, psychological or physical stress, learning, drug exposure, or trauma. Neuroepigenetics is this interplay specifically in the nervous system. The different mechanisms this happens by are described, but are a bit beyond the scope of this video. One point I want to draw attention to is from the unresolved questions at the end of the paper. Basically, it's possible that memory storage also involves epigenetic changes in addition to the more understood neuronal ones. The second question relevant to Peterson's claim is just how transmittable are these epigenetic changes to offspring? The author puts forward two types. The first are lasting changes that come about from experiences with the parent. The second is more contentious. It would involve DNA expression changes passing from parent to offspring. This is proposed to be a form of soft inheritance, as it's easier to reverse than changes to DNA. Pearson's commentary illustrates that he's overextending epigenetics, because, as we understand it now, the wisdom that would be required for learning as remembering is not possible. Peterson seemed to bring up epigenetics in the original 12 rules in a similar sort of argument, that to get yourself out of stasis and be the maximal you, you have to go out and do things. He didn't provide a reference that time around, so yay for a citation this time. In my response to the 12 rules discussion of epigenetics, I even cited the author of this chapter's reference one. As was the case last time around, it isn't clear if Peterson understands the implications or consequences of epigenetics. While some genes may be expressed more as a result of experience, or even previously epigenetically silenced genes having their mute removed, if soft inheritance is correct, thinking of this as activating dormant potential, releasing abilities built into us over the vast span of our evolutionary history, seems like a bit of a stretch. Basically, what Peterson is talking about sounds like Jung crossed with altered states, which just... No. You aren't going to summon up some ancient ability of our ancestors that isn't a part of the human skill set. You aren't going to tap into genetic wisdom to achieve your potential. Learning is not remembering. Learning is learning. And I would be remiss if I didn't call attention to this idea existing at least as a neighbor of Jung's collective unconscious, a proposed unconscious warehouse of knowledge from our ancestors that we somehow have access to. Neighboring because genetics wasn't part of the collective unconscious discussion, but this general learning is remembering past wisdom bit feels like it's implicitly assuming access to that sort of knowledge store. I'm not sure if Peterson was intending this to be a list of things that learning can be, given his general aversion to committing to any sort of list beyond the first item, but it works out that way, so that's how we're going to go through it. Things learning can be, according to Peterson. The aforementioned historical remembering as learning. Learning new stuff. He argues that humans are different from animals because we don't repeat species-specific behaviors and make new experiences a part of us. No citations for his assertions, but dolphins, chimps, and all kinds of other animals are able to learn from experience. Though, I suppose if you define species-specific behaviors broadly enough, things like conspecific observational learning or which symbol will get you a reward could be lumped in. But there we go, too. Shifting a representation of something known into a different representation. I'm not sure what he's getting at here. Clarification is not provided. Imitating actions. Generalizing the imitated action, which, quote, catches the spirit of what or whom we are observing and producing new ways of seeing and acting that are in some manner similar to that spirit. The footnote has a small discussion of professional imitators who copy the essence of the person being imitated rather than being a whole cloth copy. He also says this applies for children playing as adults. Does this mean my Peterson voice has lobstery approval now? Because I'm trying to capture the spirit? Fierce. Peterson also claims that this generalized imitation is also what supports implicit knowledge that, quote, forms so much of the basis of our true understanding. Mm -mm, nope. Out of the corner. We are in my wheelhouse. It is time to talk about implicit learning. 
We can roughly break down the types of knowledge you have into the stuff that you are consciously aware of and can describe, and the stuff that you're not consciously aware of and can't put into words. Broadly speaking, the stuff that you're consciously aware of and can describe is explicit knowledge, and the stuff that you aren't or can't is implicit. Learning something implicitly generally involves repeated exposures to some sort of information that has regularity. In practical settings, these could be things like the motor learning involved in sports, like nailing down everything that goes into getting the sports ball to do what you want, or the pattern recognition that possibly builds up to an intuitive sense for soldiers that an IED is nearby. In the lab, this can be a repeated sequence of button presses, the underlying structure behind seemingly random strings of letters, where targets are in a field of apparently random objects, and much more. We can learn a not insubstantial amount of info implicitly, but not everything, because this type of learning and the knowledge gained from it has limitations. Because you generally don't have access or awareness of what was learned, it's hard to pass that information on to others. This is part of the difficulty in teaching others how to drive. Driving as a task uses a lot of automatic processes that have been built up through sheer repetition of time behind the wheel doing stuff. Passing on that knowledge of what to do exactly in the different situations, like if the road's wet, what do you do? Passing that knowledge on to somebody else in a way that will immediately be usable is hard. And certainly you can teach people about those skills, but it's going to take time for that knowledge to shift from the explicit, consciously accessible, slower form into the implicit, automatic, fast form that is what you need when you're driving. As mentioned before, implicit learning takes a bit of time. This isn't the sort of thing where you can be explicitly told, hey, if these objects are in these positions, then the target will be here, and you'll be able to find the target super duper fast from then on out. The reality is, you need to see that object configuration over and over and over before you have the implicit knowledge base to know where to find the target. This list goes on, so for simplicity, this is the last thing we're going to touch on here. This is knowledge you have to acquire for yourself. This isn't something you can pluck from the collective unconscious. And while imitating the actions of others may be able to get you part of the way to the underlying implicit knowledge of that imitated action, you have to reinvent the knowledge wheel for yourself. Okay, back to Peterson's claim. Because implicit knowledge isn't readily consciously accessible, I doubt it can be the basis of true understanding, whatever the fuck that's supposed to mean. Also, implicit learning comes from so much more than just imitation, but enough on this point because there is more to this list. Watch something happen, write down what happened, then talk about it later. Pearson calls this last one the most mysterious. We can imagine something, then act it out. How is that learning? We can code and represent all that ability, adaptive action and its transformation, in the stories we tell about those we admire as well as those we hate. And this is how we determine who we are and who we could perhaps become. <sighs> what? What do stories have to do with any of his types of learning? How do stories tell us who we are or what our potential is? <laughs> stories become unforgettable when they communicate sophisticated modes of being, complex problems and equally complex solutions that we perceive consciously in pieces, but cannot fully articulate. It was for this reason, for example, that the biblical story of Moses and the Israelites' exodus from Egypt became such a powerful touchstone for black slaves seeking emancipation in the United States. And note two is not really a reference so much as a description of what he pulled these lines from, missing any sort of info that would be needed to actually find where he pulled this from. Doing a minimal amount of digging, there is a wiki on this that talks about the history and how the Exodus story was mapped onto the experiences of American slaves. I don't quite know about this reason for American slaves having responded to biblical stories like they did, especially when Pete starts hitting the Jung pipe. I'm not a historian, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's so much that being a slave was a complex problem and being freed required a complex solution, so much as hearing or reading the local religious stories resonated with people and gave them hope that they too would be let go and the slave owners punished. This is entirely subjective and probably a difference in opinion between me and Jorp, but I think stories can be unforgettable for a whole number of reasons. The room certainly isn't communicating a sophisticated mode of being. 
not even sophisticated filmmaking. It's unforgettable because it's a masterclass in producing a mesmerizing train wreck. Old Boy is very sophisticated filmmaking, but doesn't really seem like a complex solution we should try to emulate. Hell, same goes for Oedipus, a partial inspiration for Old Boy. Or is the sophisticated mode of being communicated there that we shouldn't kill one parent and marry the other? Abandon all brevity, ye who continue here. The biblical story of Exodus is properly regarded as archetypal or paradigmatic or foundational by psychoanalytic and religious thinkers alike because it presents an example of psychological and social transformation that cannot be improved upon. It emerged as a product of imagination and has been transformed by constant collective retelling and reworking into an ultimately meaningful form that applies politically, economically, historically, personally, and spiritually, all at the same time. What? The transformations in Exodus can't be improved upon? Why not? Although it is interesting that he's saying Exodus was first the product of imagination, which seems to be a sharp contrast to how he usually talked Bible stuff in 12 rules. I say that now, but the tune will change in the next section. I'll give him the historical and spiritual applications, but how does Exodus apply politically, economically, and personally? Why are these necessary for his definition of literary depth? This is the very definition of literary depth something that reaches its apogee in certain forms of ancient traditional stories. The fact of that depth means that such accounts can be used diversely as a meaningful frame for any process of profound change experienced by any individual or society. Stable state, descent into chaos, re-establishment of stability, and can lend that process multi-dimensional reality, context, powerful meaning, and motivation. So... Only ancient, traditional stories can be shining examples of deep literature. Why? I know at least one person who would probably argue I've been living my life wrong, but I generally don't frame my life's changes in stories I've been exposed to. Granted, I did find some comfort in The Last Starfighter given my trailing spouse status, but that was more a post hoc noticing of a resemblance rather than a frame for me to model my life on. It didn't make things more real, add meaning or motivation. It was a movie that I enjoyed as a kid that had a character end up in a fantastical version of spouse trailing that struck me as fitting. I don't even really know how stories would give me a reference frame for life changes. Stories about losing a parent didn't make my dad's death more real or give me any real framework with how to cope with it. I had to work that out for myself. Stories about higher ed in no way prepared me for the realities of undergrad or grad school. If anything, they made it harder because the shortcuts or conveniences in stories don't happen in real life. At least if your parents can't afford to buy the school building. Stories about intimate relationships tend to focus in on things that either make the relationship dysfunctional or even toxic for the sake of drama, or portray things as sunshine and rainbows when you're with the right person, which doesn't mesh with reality even for highly compatible people. Specifically for Exodus, but related to the point I was trying to make earlier, we're talking about this story because it's still culturally relevant for a portion of people. Other stories from that time period don't hold the same cultural weight because the groups associated with those stories aren't a dominant force today. It's like we're looking at the world today then extrapolating that the surviving stories are still around by virtue of being an archetypal or paradigmatic or foundational story alone, while leaving out all the forces and factors for why those stories have survived. How might an unforgettable story come to be? What might precede its revelation? It is, at the very least, a consequence of a long period of observation. Imagine a scientist monitoring the behavior of a wolf pack or a troop of chimps. Indeed, any group of complex social animals. He or she attempts to identify regularities in the behavior of the individuals and the group, patterns in a word, and to articulate those regularities, to encapsulate them in language. With a bunch of hedging, with mites at every step, Pearson describes the progression from anecdotes to general observations of animal behavior to rule-like rules. I say rule-like because the animals are not following rules. Rules require language. 
Animals are merely acting out regularities. They cannot formulate, understand, or follow rules. So many claims here. So little support. His choice of word here, revelation, strikes me as interesting. Given the earlier stuff about learning being remembering, it seems like an implication of this word is that the storyteller isn't really writing the story, they're just discovering it. Which, no? I know some creatives feel like they're just a conduit for the work, but they're still the ones making it. Are these wolves out in the wild or captivity? Because that's tripped us up before. For the however many if time, a group of chimps is called a community. Why has he narrowed his discussion to social animals? Even less social animals can learn and follow rules. Why do rules require language? What is the defining difference between rules and regularities other than language, apparently? Is it because they can't know the joy of buying the steadily increasing number of rules books? But human beings? We can observe ourselves acting as a scientist might, more accurately, as a storyteller might. Then we can tell the stories to each other. The stories are already distillations of observed behavior. If they're not distillations, they will not be interesting. Relating a sequence of everyday actions does not make for a good story. Once the story is established, we can analyze it, looking for deeper patterns and regularities. If that analysis is successful, we can generalize across anecdotes with the formulation of rules, and then we can learn, consciously, to follow those rules. Say it with me now. What? I know with the original 12 rules, I would sometimes ask what the tangent he was going off on had to do with improving one's life, but in retrospect, I could usually at least see the point in the distance. This, not so much. This seems so convoluted, but I suppose he has to do the work of trying to establish the necessity and utility of analyzing stories in this way, because that's what this chapter is going to be. And if memory serves, it pops up later in the book too. And Peterson's saying his opinion as fact, with the good stories needing to not just basically follow a person going about their day. There is a French film that's a bit of a critical favorite that follows a woman for not quite two hours as she waits to find out if she has cancer. And by follows, I mean follows. She kills time waiting for the test results. But this film also has existentialist and feminist themes interwoven into the story. Granted, it takes some skill to be able to make an interesting story out of everyday life, but to say it's not possible is hogwash. Pearson's explanation for how this might go down. We have a deep, emotional, judgmental reaction when a person or society is acting negatively. From that reaction, we can figure out the pattern that's been violated. But just because we do that, it doesn't mean we figured out the greater, quote, comprehensive philosophy of good and evil. And then what? Seriously, it's like he started a story, but didn't properly finish it. He set up that this little narrative was going to explain this story to analysis to rule formulation process, but then stops mid-analysis. Pearson continues that this is what's described in Exodus, with Moses giving advice to his crew. In consequence, Moses spends a very long time observing and contemplating their behavior. It is as if the desert prophet had to discover what rules he and his Israelite followers were already struggling to act out prior to his receipt of the explicit commandments from God. Remember, every society is already characterized by pattern behavior, otherwise it would be pure conflict and no society at all. But the mere fact that social order reigns to some degree does not mean that a given society has come to explicitly understand its own behavior its own moral code. It is therefore no accident that in this story, Moses serves as a judge for his followers, and does so with sufficient duration and intensity to exhaust himself before he receives the Ten Commandments. This judging is argued to be what prepared Moses to receive the divine rule tablets. If there had been no behavioral base for those rules, no historical precedent codified in traditional ethics, no conventions, and no endless hours of observation of the moral patterns, the commandments simply could not have been understood and communicated, much less obeyed. This is what I was hinting at earlier. Peterson's talking about this like it actually happened, rather than as a product of imagination. 
It is so frustrating to me that so much effort is being spent on trying to pick apart the deeper meanings and intent behind the story as a way to achieve some form of self-help enlightenment. Maybe it wouldn't be quite so frustrating if Peterson would just admit that he isn't giving advice from a religiously neutral place. Embrace the Christian heart of what he's doing. It would at least be more honest. So strange that rules received from the deity of a people would align with their existing ethics and moral patterns. What are the odds? Also, it always struck me as a bit, I don't know, funny? That this archetypal paradigmatic foundational story involves Moses trying to get the people to follow God's rules, somewhat failing, having a period of alone time, then coming back with the rules again, basically. But this time God wrote them down, so y'all better behave now. It really reminds me of Patton Oswalt's sky cake bit. And there's some repetition of ideas from this chapter so far. Stories inform us about who we are and who we could be, make us want to imitate them, force us to develop our dormant abilities, help us codify our morality, blah blah blah. Why do stories make us awaken dormant abilities? How? Growing up, Dr. Mr. The Husband assumed he was going to be an army engineer. He came from a military family and was good at math. Want to know why he pivoted to civilian physicist? Sure as hell wasn't the stories in other media he was being exposed to. The only character that he really cared about or resonated with was Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes, because he saw parts of himself and his experiences in that character. The thing that nudged him towards physics was me. And sure, I was interested in astrophysics because of contact, but that ended up not panning out because I suck at physics. So it goes. But Dr. Husband's physics skills weren't lying dormant. They were there. They just had to be developed. All he needed was a nudge and some belief that he could do it. And maybe, to Pearson's credit, stories can be that sort of nudge for people. Get them to try something new. But it doesn't have to be wrapped in this almost mystical shroud of stories waking the sleeper within. On that note, I don't really like the framing that implies people have dormant, untapped facets of themselves floating around in some Jungian mental space that they just need to learn to remember. It seems more parsimonious if people are able to learn new skills or pick up interests for things they vibe with. No set skill tree based on your character type necessary. The question-answer thing from the last book's coda is back, so hide your pens. Question! Who are you? Or at least, what could you be? Answer? Part of the eternal force that constantly confronts the terrible unknown, voluntarily. Part of the eternal force that transcends naivete and becomes dangerous enough, in a controlled manner, to understand evil and beard it in its lair. And part of the eternal force that faces chaos and turns it into productive order, or that takes order that has become too restrictive, reduces it to chaos, and renders it productive once again. As I said, the style madness is just out of the can in this chapter. It will not be contained. And despite all the little lobsters arguing with me that Peterson is actually trying to achieve a balance between order and chaos, nope. This is still very much confronting chaos from Order City, keeping evil chaos in its lair through dangerous but controlled order, facing chaos and forcing it back into an orderly form. The reader is placed in Order City and engaging with chaos at the edge of the unknown forest. Although, this little bit about order maybe being too orderly, so needing to push it through chaos to get good order again seems like an afterthought. Like in the process of writing, just, oh yeah, this book is supposed to be beyond order. Add a little sentence and perfect, crisis averted. And all of this! Being very difficult to understand consciously, but vital to our survival, is transmitted in the form of the stories that we cannot help but attend to. And it is in this manner that we come to apprehend what is of value, what we should aim at, and what we could be. I knew that AIM was coming back because of this rule's title, but... I do not want to have this discussion about AIM again. Why is it difficult to understand all of this consciously? Why are stories able to bridge that gap and seemingly nothing else? <sighs> I don't know about you, but the takeaway I've gotten from this so far is that stories can indicate who you could be. If we're being generous, another takeaway could be that stories communicate social values and whatnot. Which just... yeah. 
and the extra wordage around unconscious this and unknowable that didn't add much beyond obfuscation to me. And this is where we're going to end things for now because I have been staring into that void for a bit and I don't want to go style mad myself. So till next time, bye.